Hey, welcome Gathering Place family. My name is Daniel Davenport. This is More Than Sunday. Glad that you're here. If you're just joining us for the very first time, thanks. I hope that you enjoy it. You can subscribe to the video. You can like it. You can share it. And if you want more information, go to our website, tgpchurch.com. You can find out everything that's going on here at the Gathering Place. We're not only here online, but we are meeting in person on Sunday mornings at our Folsom campus, 9.30 a.m. Again, you can find that at tgpchurch.com. Well, I've been here, well, not online, but at the Gathering Place officially for one year now. <laughs> March 1st of last year, we showed up. Two weeks later, everything shut down. And while there's been a lot of challenges over the past year, uh, we didn't wait for everything to open up to say, okay, now God, what do you want to do? We put our hand to it. We've been uh, investing in the ministry, investing in our facility, our church, and preparing for what God has for us in the future while he's doing something significant today. And I really do believe that as we've just been walking this out with them, we're at a turning point in our church. We are ready to really uh, get moving and see God do some things that have only been we've only seen in here, but we're going to see them up here as well with our own eyes. So I want to encourage you, jump in with us. If you want to be part of a really a, a relaunch of a church, a restart, uh, God is doing something fresh here. So these are uh, really great times that we're in, and I'm glad to be part of it. I'd love to do it with you. All right, let's jump into the Bible. Uh, Jesus in, in John chapter 11, he's out by the river, far outside east of um, Jerusalem, Jericho even. And he gets news. He gets some bad news that one of his friends is sick. And that's where we find ourselves in the story. It says a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the, ta the town of Mary and Martha, uh, her sister. And it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Some versions say it like this, Lazarus, your friend, is sick. Now that's important because, you know, in the Old Testament, there's only one person who is ever referred to as a friend of God. That's, that's Abraham. But when you get into the New Testament, you see Jesus showing up, and the way he's talking and relating to people, even his disciples, he said this in John 15, 13 through 15. He said, greater love has no man than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. And I've called you my friends. And so Jesus is saying, look, I'm not just God up here about to do some great things for people who desperately need me, which is true. But he said, you're, you're my friends. You're not just my servants. A servant doesn't know what the master's doing. Look, I'm telling you the secrets of what's going on in the kingdom. And I'm sharing with you my heart because you're my friend. And so he's out here outside by the, the river where John the baptizer was originally baptized and where Jesus was baptized at the beginning of his ministry. And he's out there, which is the deserted place, because the Jewish people had, you know, those nice, those nice church people had threatened to kill him because he said, uh, I am, <laughs> I am, meaning he's relating to the great I am. He's identifying as the great I am. And so he gets some news that his good friend Lazarus is sick. And so when he hears it, verse 4, he says, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. I want to pause for a second there because sometimes we read that and we think, is Jesus saying that this sickness will glorify God? Is that what he's saying? I don't think that's what he's saying at all. In fact, he didn't say that. He said this sickness is not unto death. Or some versions would say this sickness will not end in death. But this is how it will end. It will end with God being glorified. With the glory of God as the Son of God is glorified through it. Through what? Through the end result. So... I point that out because sometimes you hear people say, you know, that, that sickness you're going through is really bringing glory to God. 
And, and I want to challenge that thinking a little bit because you see Jesus dying on the cross and, and taking sickness and disease upon himself. By his stripes we were healed. You see him going around constantly uh, doing good and healing all who were oppressed. He was regularly healing people of their sickness and disease. We never see him putting sickness and disease on somebody. And so the glory of God isn't in the sickness and disease. It's in the healing. It's in the restoration. It's in the health. Now, what Jesus is not saying is that all sickness ends in the glory of God. And he is also not saying that no sickness ends in death. He's speaking about Lazarus. And he says, in La with Lazarus, in this situation, this sickness will not end in death. But the, it'll end with the glory of God as the Son of God is glorified through it. So he's already indicating that, that Lazarus, is, he's, go he's going to make it. And how he makes it is by Jesus receiving glory through it. Now, there, is it possible that while somebody is sick that God can be getting glory? Absolutely. But what is he getting glory for? Nobody's sitting there saying, wow, look at how that person is just so sick right there. And, and that just makes me want to glorify God. No one. Oh, but he's a Christian. Surely God put that on him. Well, isn't God good? That's not what they're saying at all. God can be glorified while we're sick through our faith, through our uh, perseverance, our endurance, through our attitude, through the way we love other people, we encourage other people, the way that, that we uh, maintain our joy in the midst of that. The, those are ways that God can be glorified while we're sick. But it's not the sickness that glorifies God. It's you. It's you and your heart and your response to the Lord. Or it's the way that God supernaturally uh, enables you to, to persevere and be healed, to, re to recover. Those things also glorify God. So even if you're sick unto death, meaning this, man, you got sick and you died. <laughs> Uh, but if you if the whole way you go out praising and honoring God, man, even in death, even in sickness up to death that leads to death, you can bring glory to God. But just to clarify what that verse means, God didn't put the sickness on Lazarus so that he could get glory. That's not what happened here at all. So it doesn't say that in the text. There's no reason to believe that or to misunderstand it. So. Jesus is saying, though, that God's going to get the glory at the end of this. Now, verse 5, La Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard that he was sick, he stayed there two more days in the place where he was. I think that Mary and Martha probably were expecting to get the word to Jesus so that Jesus would come while Lazarus was sick so that he could heal him. But that's not what Jesus did. He stuck around and he waited and he delayed. Why? Because this wouldn't end in death. It would, it, it would end in God being glorified through this. Okay, so he's waiting there. And as he's waiting, somehow he knows that Lazarus is now dead. And so he says to his disciples, Hey, Lazarus, our friend, sleeps. Let's go, and I'm going to wake him up. Now his disciples, they're like, Ugh. And they say, Well, if he's asleep, then he's going to get better, right? And Jesus is like, okay, guys, Lazarus is dead, right? I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to watch my words in the midst of this, but he's gone. He's dead. So I got to go and wake him up, meaning raise him up out of death back to life. But verse 15, he says something interesting. He said, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, Let's go to him. Why would Jesus say, I'm glad I wasn't there. My friend was sick and now he died. And I'm glad I wasn't there. <laughs> Is he saying, because I don't want to see that stuff. Is that why he's saying it? Or no, he said, for your sakes. I'm glad I wasn't there for your sakes that you may believe. I, I, I think this is why. Nowhere in the New Testament does anyone ever, is it recorded that they die in his presence. In the presence of Jesus. 
Also, every time Jesus runs across a dead person in the New Testament, he raises them up from the dead. He does it with Jairus' daughter. He does it with the widow's son. Heck, even when he died, he raised from the dead. And that's the, the Bible says this in, in Acts 2.24. Death could not hold him. You know why? He's the resurrection and the life, as he says later on in verse 25. Like, this is who he is. He is the prince of life. He is the author of life. It is his nature. Life emanates from him. He spoke and all things existed. He said, he, he, he uh, in him is, is life and that life is the light of men. Like, this is who he is. And so if he was around Lazarus, Lazarus couldn't have died because it's the very nature of Jesus to overcome death and everything that is associated with it or the symptoms thereof, which sickness is ultimately a symptom of death. It's a result of sin. Even if someone doesn't get sick because they sinned, sickness is a result of fall, the fallen nature. Our bodies, we were designed to live forever with God. Sickness is just the breakdown of these bodies. And uh, ultimately, when we are resurrected in the presence of God, we're going to have resurrected bodies not subject to sickness because they're not subject to sin. But Jesus says, I'm glad we weren't there. You're going to see something here. You're going to believe. And so they head out and they're heading, you know, probably it must be a, a two day journey or so to get to Mary and Martha where they were. And he shows up, verse 20, Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house still. You know, Martha was always the one up in Adam. Mary was the one that's kind of sit, sitting around and uh, she's just waiting. And so Martha says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's the first thing she has to say to him. If you were here when we called for you, we wouldn't be going through this situation. You can imagine that uh, in one sense, she is sitting here saying, man, I knew you were the solution, so we called for you. And also that grieving of, but why didn't you come? And this is probably very common for many followers of Christ. We believe God, you can and you would, but why didn't you? It didn't happen. And she says, even now though, I know whatever you ask of God, God will do for you. And so she hasn't lost all hope. Jesus said to her, your brother will live again. Your brother will rise again. And she said, I know he'll, he'll, he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Now, Jesus is saying, don't let death get in your way of living. I am the resurrection and the life. I don't simply raise people from the dead. I am the resurrection. It's not just something I do. It is my very nature. Life is who I am. And so me coming into proximity with you and your, your broken family, the, the mess that you're in, I'm going to turn the situation around from death to life. Not just because I do it, because it's who I am. And that's the very presence of God. That's how he operates. When Jesus enters into your situation, he's not just giving you a promise for, hey, if you just hold on for the next 40 years, when you finally die at 98 years old, that's when it's all going to be worth it. But he says, no, right now, regardless of your past, regardless of how bad the situation is, when I show up, when you invite me in, to your life, I'm going to turn some things around. This is what he, he's saying to Martha right here. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Once you place your faith and trust in Jesus, death from this body, all it is is a doorway to more life with God. But in the meantime, until that point, you should be expecting the full, abundant life that comes from Christ and living in it. This is what he is 
inviting us into. And then he says to her, do you believe this? She said, of course I believe. Yes, I believe you're the Christ. You're the son of God who's coming to the world. And then she went away and she called her, her sister Mary. Mary gets up and she runs him. First thing she says, Lord, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. So obviously these two had been talking about how uh, if Jesus showed up on the scene, things would have been different. So she's talking to him. He's troubled on the inside. Verse 34 says, he says to her, where have you laid him? And she said, come and see. When Jesus goes to the tomb, he's overwhelmed with emotion. And we get to the shortest verse of the Bible. Jesus wept. And I love this here because Jesus is truly God. And he also knows what his intention is. He's going there so he can raise Jesus, uh, Lazarus from the dead. But yet, in that very moment, he weeps. And the Bible doesn't say, and Jesus wept because of this. But have you ever thought, why did Jesus weep? I know people come up with, with reasons for it. But understand this. Jesus wasn't disassociated from the situation. He wasn't sitting there like, okay, guys, all right, I'm going to have the angels show up over here and then everybody line up over here outside the cave. And then don't you worry because I came to heal Lazarus and watch this, Lazarus, come on out. And look, guys, everything's okay. That's not how he's operating. Jesus, though he's very much fully God, he's also fully man. And he's in the moment. And he feels the pain of those around him. He looks at the brokenness that they're experiencing, the weeping, the grieving. And also, remember this, that this, these people, they're his daily delight. You and I are his daily delight. And so when he sees us experiencing the consequences of a rebellion that took place back in the garden, when Adam and Eve were his daily delight, who he would fellowship with, and then as a result of sin, when they turned their back on God, he had to be separated and pulled back from them and banish them from his presence and watch them through the generations that followed as they were devoured and eaten up by sin and ultimately death. And he's looking at his friend, Lazarus, who had died. And I think there is this overwhelming emotion that welled up inside of him. And the Bible just simply records the words, Jesus wept. It's very simple there. Verse 36, the Jews said, see how he loved them. Then we get to verse 38. Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was this, uh, the, this attempt to check his emotions and not be overwhelmed or driven by his emotions because he was there on mission still. And though he felt the pain and the weight of all the situation, he couldn't let his emotions take lead here. So he groans within himself. He, he brings himself under composure. And he comes to the tomb. It was a cave. And the stone laid against it. And so this was common because for the Jews, when, when someone would die, they would, they would bury them in a cave and have, you know, not underground. They would bury them there and allow for the um, body to decay. And eventually they would collect the bones and then put the bones into a box and put it into a, a burial place with other family members, typically. Jesus is at the cave and he's looking at it and he sees the big stone that's blocking the entrance. And so he says to him, take away the stone. But Martha, always the practical one, she speaks up and says, uh, Lord, by this time, there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Now, she, she's right. There would probably be a, a stench. In the old King James Version, it says, by now he stinketh, right? He stinketh. But the four days is significant because it's just the natural process of a body that decomposes. The first uh, couple days after death, your internal organs, they start to break down. Your your body starts to actually um, consume itself in many, many ways. 
But then after about three to five days, that's when uh, the bloating happens. That's the swelling. The human body can, can swell to about two times its normal size. Rigor mortis set, sets in. This um, terrible odors and gases are released during this time. So that's how the body is, is breaking down naturally. And, and by the way, the Jewish mindset at the time, many people believe like the first, the first three days was the, the time of weeping after death. And the next four days was the time of lamenting. So for seven days, they would mourn the death of a loved one. And, and part of the thought was, now this isn't a biblical teaching or understanding, but a common thought was for three days after the death of someone, their soul would be searching for a way to get back into the body, but after the fourth day, move on. And so maybe Martha had this mindset as well that, that not only is his body decomposed, like, uh, but his soul has moved on. And the soul won't come back to that decomposing body. And, and so she's just pointing out to Jesus how all this stuff works. And I think it's really interesting because that's our tendency too, to justify why, why Jesus can't do a miracle in this situation because uh, he doesn't really understand how all this stuff works. Like we know because our experience tells us that, you know, I've done this or they've done that or so-and-so said or the doctor said or you know, my boss said, or my spouse said, or I just have never been able to. And so and you see God, that's just not how it works. So she explains to Jesus the process of death. I love that. She's explaining to the creator of all things how death works. She's, she's telling the resurrection and the life what happens when someone dies and why it's not a good idea to open the tomb. Because when you open the tomb, you're going to see some things that you don't want to see and you're going to be faced with reality. In fact, you're going to smell reality because he stinketh. And so Jesus, he looks at her and he says, well, of course you're right. I, you know, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have disturbed you. No, that's not what he says at all. He just simply <laughs> said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, Martha, did I not say that if you will believe, you will see the glory of God? The prerequisite for seeing the glory of God. Did you hear the voice of the Lord? Did you listen to what he's saying? And number two, do you believe? So it's not even just, did you hear the voice of the Lord? You'll see the glory of God. It's not even, if you just believe for the glory of God, it's going to happen. But did you, do you believe what God said? That's why we say, get in the word of God. Stick with the word. Even if you can't understand everything that's going on, stick with the word. Believe the word. You'll see the glory of God. Jesus said, he's the resurrection and the life. He's going to raise him up. Did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? What happens if you don't believe? If you stop believing? You don't roll away the, the, the stone. You don't believe. You don't see the glory of God. Sometimes we have to look back and say, maybe I missed it because I gave up in faith. I know I, I've done that, by the way. Uh, by the way, I would never tell somebody, the reason why God didn't come through for you is because you're not a believer. Never say that stuff to anybody. Never sit there and say, because you're not believing enough. You're not reading enough. You're not praying enough. You're not anything enough. And never say that. It's never helpful. But do be open for your own self to consider, man, am I in faith? Am I standing and believing God's word? Is there any, is there a mixture on the inside? Jesus says, only believe, right? Don't be afraid, only believe. So he's, this is what he says to her. I guess that was good enough for them because verse 41 says, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying and Jesus lifted up his eyes and he says, Father, I thank you that you hear me. And I know that you always hear me, nevertheless, for the sake of those standing around so that they believe. That's why I said that. I thank you that you heard me. And then he turns, and in a loud voice, he cries out. In verse 43, he says, Lazarus, come forth. Now this is the voice of authority. This is the same voice that said in the midst of darkness, light be. And it was. Who brought forth all creation 
with the sound of his voice. And so here is the author of life facing a dead man. And he doesn't go on and touch. He doesn't even move the stone himself. He says, you guys, prepare for the miracle. Prepare for the miracle. Roll the stone away. What is the barrier between uh, the miracle and, 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 uh, and God doing it? You know, like now and the miracle. What is the barrier there that you are responsible for? Jesus doesn't roll away the stone. And you don't raise Lazarus from the dead. You do what only you can do. Let him do what only he can do. Lazarus come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, not to him, said to them, Loose him and let him go. Jesus commands this dead guy who's laying down in the bottom of this cave to come forth. Calls that guy's spirit right back into his body. Wherever his spirit was, maybe it was in, in, in the holding place. You know, the Bible would teach about uh, Hades or Abraham's bosom. He calls his spirit back to his body. He calls his, his, his body from that darkness to light, from the grave, you know, at the bottom of the grave to the opening. And there he is. He doesn't walk there. Immediately he sprung up to there. Jesus' words had authority. And he's wrapped up basically head to foot. Everybody's standing around looking. I mean, imagine if you're there and you saw Jesus you know, speak and, and command this guy to come up. And, and then he's, he's there before your eyes. You see it. Everyone's frozen. Jesus looks around. Get the guy out of his grave clothes, right? What are you doing? Don't just sit there looking at him. Loose that man and let him go. And so, you know what? They did it. Now, I love this story. Because it shows us the authority of God. That even the worst thing that could happen to somebody, God is greater than that. And someone could be in the furthest point from seeing God's plan take place in their life. And one word from God can turn all that around. It shows me the power of intercession on calling on Jesus on behalf of others. In fact, as we read the story, I, I wonder who you identify with. Are you like Mary and Martha, who, you know, you're, you're believing God on behalf of a brother, a sister, a family member, a friend, and you are interceding for them, and you're calling on Jesus. Are you at that point, or, or maybe you're at that point of wondering, why hasn't Jesus shown up? And you're processing through all of that. Maybe you see yourself there and you got to see how did Jesus react and relate to them in their situation. He shows up. He's an on-time God. I love that song. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. He may not come when you want him to, but he'll be there right on time because he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. And he showed up on time so that God might be glorified through it. But they had to continue believing so maybe if you're in that place where you're praying for that kid, you're praying for that stinky old husband, you're praying for your boss or your job, your business, you're praying for somebody else, you're contending, you're interceding. Don't give up. Continue to believe. Maybe, maybe you're like Lazarus. Maybe you're bound up by something. Maybe you're in a real stinky situation. Maybe you're feeling at a place where there's nothing I can do to change it. It's over. This, my hopes, my dreams, my plan, my marriage, my future, my ministry, it's dead. Don't stay there. Listen to the voice of God. Listen to him today saying, come forth. Maybe, maybe. You're right on the other side of that, that tombstone. 
And that tombstone is something that is, needs to be removed out of your life so that you would experience the glory of God, the miraculous power of God, the hand of God in your life. Maybe that, that stone that's blocking or interfering or separating or limiting the power of God from being at work in your life, it might be unforgiveness, bitterness, pride, arrogance. Maybe you've gossiped. Maybe you've criticized. Maybe it's something like that that would seem natural, normal, like a stone in front of a grave. But, but I'm here today to move that out of the way and tell you, don't let that stay. Get it out of the way. Anything that would limit you, hold back the, the plan of God from your life, you can't let it sit there. Because if you do, you're going to be stuck on the other side. And you know what? Life is going to stink. And you'll see other people flourishing, coming to life, experiencing the goodness of God. And you're going to want to experience that, but you're going to do it from afar. And it won't be personal because you've got these things that are blocking. And so is God saying to you today, today, Move that stone, that hard heart, whatever it is, the bitterness. Maybe there is pain that was legitimate and, and someone hurt you. But, but, but now what? Are you going to sit there on the other side and miss out on Jesus? Or maybe, let me just say this, maybe you would identify with those who have to loose that man to let him go. Imagine this, Jesus is saying, to those people around, go up to this guy who's experienced <laughs> life from death and get those grave clothes off of him. Maybe there, God is calling you to step up and outside of yourself in your comfort zone and start to minister to people like never before. Do you think four days by now, he stinketh? That means those grave clothes, they stunk. That, that what he was wrapped in, you know when a body decomposes, like the stuff on the inside, it starts to come on the outside. And so he's wrapped up, and you know what it's doing? It's absorbing that. And here's the deal, is he came from death to life, but he was still a mess. And he needed somebody to come alongside of him and help him get out of that mess. You know what we call that? We call it ministry. <laughs> you know what we call it? We call it disciple making. And Jesus might very well be calling you to not just experience your miracle and, oh, isn't that amazing, but for you to come alongside someone else and to lay your life down to minister to others, to disciple others, to help them out and get free and encourage them and bring them life and, and speak into their life and, and partner together with them and disciple them. Maybe that's who... It's calling you to identify with. My guess is this, that each of us identifies with probably all of them in some way. What is Jesus saying to us as a church? He's telling us it's time for us to come out. Whatever would have caused us uh, to be held back, whatever is from the past that would almost, we would think, ah, the hopes, the dreams, the best that God had for us, it, it's dead, it's buried. He says, no, it's not. No, it's not. Now it's time, gathering place, come forth. Now is the time for, as a result of what I'm doing in your life, read the next verse, many believed. What God is doing here at this church, many will believe as a result. But what do you have to do? What do you have to do? Oh, Jesus. Have your way in my life. Whatever it is on the inside of me that you want to do, God, I'm here to surrender my life. Lay it down. I'm not wanting to, to live life my way, to, to do what brings me the most comfort or that is just the most beneficial to me. But Lord, I want to fulfill your plan in my life and lay it down for others. Maybe that's what God is saying to us as a church. And I believe this, that he is calling us out right now. He's calling us out. And wherever you are, you're listening to this here. God is saying, I want to use you. I want to use you. 
as a result of what he did in the life of Lazarus, many other believed. And then even down, as you continue to read in the Gospel of John, you see people kept coming just to see what God had done in the life of Lazarus. And I believe that the same thing is true for us as a church. Well, I know God has a great future for us. I want to invite you, jump in wholeheartedly. If you're able to make it uh, in person, 9.30 on Sunday mornings, show up. If you're at a distance somewhere far away, let us know how we can pray for you and partner with you and see God use you wherever you're at. Until then, I want you to keep praying for us, keep pressing in to Jesus, and live out your faith more than Sunday. God bless you.